Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Andrzejczyk. Uh, I minister the Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Thanks a lot for joining us, uh, wherever you may be joining us from. Uh, we have a very interesting event today. We have a book presentation by Mikhail Vinitsky of his book, Ukraine's Maidan, Russia's War, a Chronicle and Analysis of the Revolution of Dignity. This is the book itself. And there are copies, uh, links to the book um, listed. Uh, and we'd like to thank Book Culture for helping to promote this event. Uh, our friends at Book Culture down the street. Um, before we begin our event, I just have a few uh, notes about programming we have for getting into the final third, I guess, of our, some, of our fall semester. Uh, and we still have some events for you in our Ukraine Studies program. Uh, November 17th at 7 p.m., our Ukrainian Film Club at Columbia University has a film event entitled Young Ukrainian Filmmakers on What It Means to Be Ukrainian Today. Uh, this is at 7 p.m. on November 17th. Now, this is going to be an in-person only event. Um, it's in room 1219 in the International Affairs Building. You have to have a Columbia University ID to attend. Um, and so if you can, please, please do come. Uh, I understand it's going to be several different Ukraine filmmakers and their films will be discussed by uh, our own Yuri Shevchuk. Uh, November 30th, um, I will be moderating a talk with Murislav Skandri, who's visiting us this fall semester and teaching two courses in our program. Uh, this will be a hybrid event. So uh, again, Columbia University ID holders can come in person uh, to 1219, room 1219 International Affairs Building. Other, everybody else could, uh, we invite you to watch online. And the topic of the uh, Murislav Skandri's presentation is Wellspring, Wellsprings of David Bolduc's Art exploring his enduring inspiration from Kachoka to New York. And that's at noon on the 30th. And then December 9th uh, at noon, we also have a hybrid event. Uh, Katerina Yakovenko will be giving a talk entitled Memory Battles and Ukrainian Contemporary Art. And our own Olena Martinuk, who's our visiting uh, Yasek fellow, she will be the discussant for that event that's at noon on, 9th, on the 9th, and that is a hybrid event. So please come and join us if you can. Now, our event today is uh, a virtual only, uh, and it is being recorded. So you'll be able to watch it later uh, if you need to leave at some point. Um, I will introduce our speaker and after his presentation, uh, you'll get a chance to post questions uh, through YouTube and through Zoom and I will read them to our speaker. Um, so our speaker today is Mikhail Vinitsky. He is associate professor at the National University Cave Mohil Academy and at the Lviv Business School of Ukrainian Catholic University. He's also served as advisor to Ukraine's Ministry of Education and Science. And in 2019, he was appointed head of the Secretariat of Ukraine's National Agency for Higher Education Quality Assurance. Uh, Mikhail was awarded a PhD in economic sociology in 2003 from the University of Cambridge. Between 2008 and 13, he served as director of the doctoral school at Cave Mohila Academy, where he oversaw a project aimed at reforming the traditional Ukrainian aspirantura system into European style doctorate. These activities led to his direct involvement in educational reform and in Ukrainian politics more generally. During the Revolution of Dignity, Mikhailo was a regular commenter for English language media outlets. Uh, many of you have read his blogs on uh, entitled Thoughts from Ukraine on Facebook. Uh, originally from Canada, he has lived permanently in Kiev with his wife and four children since 2003. Mikhailo's book, Ukraine's Maidan, Russia's War, a Chronicle and Analysis of the Revolution of Dignity, was published by Ibidem Verlag in 2019, which is distributed by Columbia University Press, and in Ukrainian translation uh, this year in 2021. So I welcome Mikhailo and eagerly await your presentation. Prosho. Well, thank you very much, Marko. Um, thank you for <clears throat> thank you for hosting me. Thank you for having me. I have a bit of a presentation here that I'll, I'll share uh with you and hopefully uh, i just did something wrong here but i will do this correctly um yeah uh if you can just verify 
that you can actually see that. I would be very okay. Good. So um, yeah, uh, the book is is um, published in 2019, and this year it came out in uh, in Ukrainian translation. Uh, that actually is it's important to say that it's in 2019 because, um, as I'll talk a little bit, uh, revolutions are long term events. It's not something that just sort of happens on a short term basis. And I interpret uh, the, uh, the the revolution of dignity as something that is actually an ongoing event, looking at some parallels perhaps with uh, other revolutions in the world. Um, specifically, for example, the U.S. case. Uh, but I, um, uh, I think it's important to understand that, that at some point in time, I had to sort of break, break off and, and, and the book had to be written. So uh, 2018, the, last, the, the end of 2018 is really 2013 to 2018. That five-year period is what's covered here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that because it, it is truly a chronicle on the first half of the book and then a bit of a sort of a social science analysis in the second half. So where does this come from? Um, and I think it's important to, to understand a little bit of sort of the um, uh, the background of what I was writing. Uh, as you mentioned, I did a lot of, uh, of, of commentary to very various Western journalists, uh, various social scientists, people that were coming in from the English speaking world. And not only I do speak a little bit of French as well. Uh, and uh, very often when people were sort of you know, I guess parachuted into Kyiv or or into the eastern eastern Ukraine or into Crimea. Uh, usually, they did come through Kyiv in one way or another. Um, they they looked at Ukraine very much as sort of the Ukraine crisis, right? And so that and that was very much influenced by a pedigree that unfortunately we find, in my opinion, unfortunately we find quite often in the uh, Western social science literature. Um, specifically, for example, uh, I would say that my um, uh, in Russian, it would be uh, so my, my, I guess the person that I'm, I'm very much in sort of in, uh, in, uh, in discussion with would be Richard Sakwa, who very often uh, in his book, Frontline Ukraine, looks at the, 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 the Ukraine crisis as something that is basically an issue to be solved or to be looked at um, through an international geopolitical lens. And I thought that that was really a wrong way of looking at things because I had lived through this. And what I was really looking to do was to look at the, the, the revolution as a revolution and to try to give some voice to uh, the, the people that were on the ground uh, and doing, doing the revolution on the Maidan and then doing the revolution, or if you, if you like, doing the revolutionary war during, during the, uh, the, the defense efforts um, uh, once, the Rus once Russia's aggression began uh, both in Crimea and in the East. Obviously the international context is important, but I think it's very important to have local actors uh, deserve, they deserve a voice. And this was really, the purpose of the book was to try to give a little bit of voice to, uh, to, to local actors. And I'm very pleased about the fact that the, um, uh, the book actually came out with, uh, in, in the first of a series called Ukrainian Voices. And now we're at, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, volume 19 in this series. But this was a, uh, the idea here was to try to give some voice to, um, uh, to local actors and to, to give some agency uh, to people on the ground. Um, again, as I mentioned, my, my, my thoughts are that Ukraine's revolution is ongoing. And in this case, what I'm doing is I'm basing myself on the, the, the work of Crane Brinton, which those of you that are, that are political science people know that this is a classic that is followed by, uh, by political scientists uh, worldwide, and it talks about sort of the, the life cycle of revolutions, in that the, uh, the, the violent overthrow of the Ancien Regime is actually the beginning of the revolution, rather than sort of the, the, uh, the end of it. Um, so we talk about, for example, uh, certain things that follow the, uh, the overthrow, and usually it's followed by a sort of a period of, of moderate reform, and then in the French case and in the Russian case, it would be followed by terror, and in the U.S. case, which I hope, I, I certainly would like to believe is more comparable to the Ukrainian, it's followed by a sort of a, uh, a, an institution building period. I looked at revolution in this book through a very much an idealist rather than a structural lens. So for example, for specifically, I'm, I state in the book that if you want to understand what is going on in Ukraine, I really recommend that you read more Hanna Arendt than you would read Theres Kotfold. Um, so Arendt is talking about sort of a completion adjustment of historical trajectories being something very important to revolution. And in this case, I interpret it as being part of the national dimension, um, an inflection point, uh, which is sort of the post-industrial dimension, economic um, development, and sort of a, a, a and, and Arendt talks an awful lot about the concept of novelty 
uh, and in fact, she 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 refers to the sort of the passion of the passion of, of newness. Um, and here I'll talk about about this a little bit more as well. Um, those are sort of the three dimensions that I, I, I examine in the analysis portion. Um, but in actual fact, the beginning of the, the the book, the first half, is very much sort of an emotional chronicle. I, I lived through. I think something that um, was pretty unique. Uh, I'd like to think that it was pretty unique. And I know, and obviously I'm one of millions of people that lived through this. I start with this um, photograph, the, the chap that you see that's uh, uh, um, in the sort of in the distance, unfortunately not very well, not very in focus, uh, who's carrying pylons. Um, approximately, I think about 10 seconds after the, I, I shot this photo, uh, he was actually shot by a sniper uh, or rather a, a Berkut officer uh, that popped out from behind the Stella to Independence Monument that you see in the background. And this was the first time that I saw somebody getting shot. And the fact that this was this close, uh, frankly, meant that I was I was going to get out of there. Um, and and I, I got pretty emotional about this whole thing because this was the first time that I actually saw people getting shot and was witness to this. Um, now, I'm, I'm jumping forward because obviously... Uh, the, the, I'll talk a little bit about how, how we got to this point. Um, one of the symbols of the Maidan and the revolution in general was the burned out trade unions building, which you see here. Uh, this was actually attacked in February by the regime forces uh, and was burnt. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, this is actually a, a demonstration, a mass demonstration, uh, a funeral procession to those who fell. Uh, and we had approximately 100, about over 100 people who actually were, were killed by sniper fire um, during the uh, the events of February 2014, some of those people were very close to us. Uh, Sashko, who is uh, uh, was actually a um, Alexander Plekhanov, uh, was a graduate of my kid's school, uh, and obviously these things caught, came very very close close to heart in terms of. With them. Um, the events that we talk about start as Euromaidan, and I think it's important to understand that that notion or that label. Uh, became really very much a misnomer very quickly, but nevertheless started off as a very sort of romantic student-led revolution. Uh, it was about European education. It was about breaking the wall for European for history students and for European students and being able to travel. And obviously for me, it was very important because many of my students from Cape Mohill Academy uh, were very much part of the, the sort of the, the I guess, the, the core of the, of the protesters. Um, but on December, on the night of December 1st, in other words, December 30th, December 1st, uh, they were attacked. And as a matter of fact, this didn't make a lot of sense. They're being attacked because quite frankly, they, they, were, they were ready to get dispersed anyway. And I talk about this quite a bit in the book. Yanukovych had decided not to sign the, um, the, uh, uh, the agreement on uh, European Association. And the students were dispersing anyway. Uh, they were starting having one last Saturday night um, spent together. Many of them were sort of huddling, romantic. Um, some were smoking um, various things in the uh, on the square, and uh, there was really no reason for the attack. There was about 300 of them there that night, and at three in the morning, they were attacked by 1,253 uh, very heavily armed uh, stormtroopers, if you like. Mm, many of them fled, uh, fled into the uh, about 400 meters away. Or, there's a monastery, uh, St. Michael's Monastery. Many of them fled into there. Approximately 100 were hospitalized that night. That created a reaction. And on December 1st, we had uh, basically up to about a million people on the streets. And we were definitely at a million people a week later on December 8th. And at this point, it was no longer about Euromaidan. And this is something that you actually see very well on this photograph, uh, very few European flags at this point. Um, in other words, this was very much a different kind of revolution. Although, so, uh, although again, from a, from a European standpoint and from the journalist standpoint, the label, the label Euromaidan definitely stuck. Um, the protesters themselves, uh, this was done on December 2nd, in other words, the day after the, the major protests. Uh, Hoshanian Institute did a, a sort of a, a, a as random as you can get um, survey, I guess, of the people standing on the streets. And what you found is about 50% of them were from Kiev. And this kind of is very important and, and another 10% were from Kiev region. And the reason I talk about this is because there is a misnomer about the protests in Kiev generally being about sort of Western Ukrainians coming to the capital, uh, Ukrainian speakers, etc. This was very much about the capital 
protesting. The capital was rebelling. And the capital itself was shut down for a period of three months. And what you see here is a sort of an artist rendition from my book about the barricades and the major things that were set up in the center of the city. So you see the barricades being uh, sort of the, the dotted lines, uh, I guess, uh, one on Institutska Street, one on this end of Khrushchev, and then another one would be further, further out in that direction. Uh, the major stage would be number one. Uh, I think uh, the, there was the, the, the Christmas tree, which was never actually assembled the full way, and that became one of the symbols of the Maidan. And then three and four, I think, are interesting spots, which we talk about when we try to understand the, the, the feel of the protest. Number four is something called the IT tent, which provided sort of live streaming and Wi-Fi, because how can you do a protest without live streaming and Wi-Fi at the same time? Lot number three, which is next door to it, was the church tent. And this is something that was sort of an interesting thing where you had side by side the sort of this this um, this element of, if you like, traditionalism. And I would even say perhaps, um, well, let's just say traditionalism and next to it sort of high tech. Uh, there was the main stage at number one. And then there was something that I was very much involved with, which is number five, which we called the Open University of Maidan. We found that uh, many people on they, they, were, they were spending their nights, spending their days um, in the cold, protesting, uh, and we, we would never have, the, the, num the protest numbers would never drop below 10,000, uh, and many times would, would run into the hundreds of thousands. Many of these people needed some sort of an intellectual, uh, an intellectual, I guess, stimulus. Um, and that sort of that intellectual stimulus became a sort of a, a topic of conversation where we had some ideas that came out of that. Um, I'm actually pretty proud of this because this became one of the major barricades this was sort of a banner that was put up on one of the major barricades, and this became one of the results of the lecture that I was that I was giving at the Open University of Maidan. Um, and this was again one of the sort of the symbols that I'll talk about a little bit about understand us, uh, we're fed up. That would be, I guess, the the uh, the, the Russian the translation from the Russian. Um, please understand us. And we had a lot of symbolism about, um, for example, uh, please excuse the in in inconvenience. Uh, we're rebuilding a country. Um, you know, these types of things would be would be very common slogans um, that were very much, very much about mobilization and also about sort of trying to maintain the support from the local population uh, that was not necessarily involved in protest, but certainly was was very much supportive of what was going on in the center of the city. We need to understand the center of the city is shut down for three months. And that's um, we're talking about a silly city of about three and a half million people. Uh, to shut down the center for, for, for three months is, is it, obviously you need a lot of support from uh, the local population. That support uh, would become very vocal and very instrumental, on, particularly on Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, this is actually a, a picture from New Year's uh, and sort of the most romantic place that you could possibly have a, uh, have a, a New Year's celebration uh, 2013 to 14 would have been Maidan Mizalajnosti or Independence Square. And as you can see, just a few people got together that night. Um, in January, things got ugly. Uh, January 19th, 2014 is when we saw our first violence. And this was something that was really very much a, a shocker for a lot, a lot of people in Ukraine. Because up until that time, uh, and we need to remember from, to, from 1991 to 2014, Ukraine was pretty well the only Soviet Republic, former Soviet Republic, that had never experienced any kind of political violence in its post-Soviet period. And that was something that Ukrainians were actually quite proud of. And that ended abruptly on January 19th. Uh, it, the, the, um, uh, the violence itself, the street violence, didn't last for very long. It moved off into the outskirts of the Maidan. In other words, we'd have people that would be beaten uh, not on the Maidan itself. The Maidan itself was a very safe place to be, but as soon as you got off the Maidan, uh, that's when you could have been hunted down by various people like what we call Titushke and other types of thugs. This is a, a local politician by the name of Ihor Lutsenko who was beaten. And unfortunately, the person who, who he was traveling with at the time was also beaten and did not survive the beatings. Uh, this was in the forests outside of Kiev. This gentleman uh, by the name of um, Kozak or Havriluk, uh, Ivan Havriluk, we call him Kozak Havriluk, uh, was publicly humiliated by the, uh, the people that arrested him. Uh, what you see in the background would be police officers that uh, stripped him naked and had him um, had him go out into the snow. Um, and obviously what you're seeing here is they're filming him, uh, which gives you a pretty good idea of, of how 
um, sort of, I guess, one of the mobilizations of, of what was going on with people were, were, were horrified by what the regime was doing and the way they were treating people. It got even worse on February 19th. Uh, this was a month later, uh, February 18th and 19th, we see our first mass uh, mass beatings. And these were, this was when the Maidan itself was actually uh, beginning to die down as a protest. Uh, this particular photograph is of a father and son, uh, both of whom, well, actually the father is a professor at Kiev Polytechnic. The son was a PhD student, um, now a professor at Kiev Polytechnic as well. Um, both of them uh, were beaten in front of the parliament building uh, during a protest uh, by police officers. And obviously, this whole thing got really bad when uh, we got to a point of sniper fire and uh, an additional 40 or 45 people being killed by snipers. There's an awful lot of talk about where the sniper fire came from, and there's a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about that. Uh, the conspiracy theory that I find most uh, believable would be that uh, this was in fact something that was inspired, uh, but, or if not, if, if not specifically organized, um, by the Kremlin uh, in the center of Kyiv, because obviously the Kremlin was very much interested in seeing um, seeing Ukraine uh, become a failed state and actually go down into um, into internal chaos. That became very obvious in the months after the Maidan. Uh, there is a there's a section in the book where I talk about how Yanukovych uh, basically exited the country with uh, with Putin's help, uh, and there is certainly a significant amount of evidence today uh, that points to the fact that the plan, the Russia's plan was a little bit different than in fact what happened. Uh, Yanukovych was supposed to have proclaimed uh, Eastern and Southern Ukraine uh, to have been independent or if not independent, then at least he would have asked, he should have, he should have asked for uh, specific help from Putin um, in, in late February. He failed to do that and therefore plan B went into action. Um, it began with obviously what we call the little green men in Crimea. And this is something that is detailed in the book as to where they came from, how they came from, what particular uh, units uh, they were from, et cetera. These things are about actually become very well documented at this point. And we know that even though uh, the Kremlin denied it initially, it's quite obvious that this was a uh, at first covert and then in fact, not very covert invasion. Uh, in the eastern part of the country, in the Donbass, uh, it was less covert. It became actually quite overt because when you had tanks and book uh, uh, anti-aircraft being moved into the country, that was um, something that is very difficult to hide. Uh, Ukrainians were very interesting in terms of their reaction to this. We had a massive volunteer movement. Uh, which numbered in the hundreds of thousands of people that would literally uh, volunteer for military service uh, in what we called volunteer battalions. Some of them became somewhat uh, controversial, which we can talk about that a little bit. But the point is that this was a mass mobilization. The Ukrainians felt that they were being invaded. Uh, their country was being invaded. And the mobilization, in fact, came from the central regions of the country, primarily. Interestingly enough, not from the West but from the central regions of the country. Uh, mobilization at first was quite romantic. Then we quite literally and quite quickly realized that war is far from romantic. But nevertheless, mobilization was not just only about uh, mobilizing forces in terms of military help, but also volunteering various types of, of, uh, of um, uh, materiel. Um, perhaps most, um, I, I just wanted to point this out, that in fact, this was a worldwide mobilization because the Ukrainian diaspora, particularly in Canada and the US, uh, were very active in supporting something called the International First Aid Kit provision. Uh, in other words, something that was uh, something that was considered to be quite sort of quasi-military, quasi-humanitarian aid. Um, and this was really very, really quite, a, quite, a, quite an amazing uh, mobilization, uh, sort of groundswell of support for what was going on in Ukraine at the time. So what I try to detail in the book is a little bit of a chronicle as well as the Maidan, but also the chronicle of the war in the Donbass. One of the things that is poorly understood is what was actually going on on the ground. And I will, I will point out that I was actually not, the closest that I ever got to the front was approximately 15 kilometers, which is about 10 miles. Um, I'm not a military person myself, um, but nevertheless, I did, um, I did try to, to understand what was going on. And in July, 
this, uh, this, what was going on in, in the Donbass uh, was very much looked like it was being, uh, uh, it was a sort of a, a, a civil disturbance that quite frankly, the, the, the volunteer battalions were quite um, uh, successfully, I guess, uh, putting down. Um, when we look at the MH17 crash site uh, and the map of the uh, of what we call the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics on the 17th of July, what you can see is that this is actually this this is a very limited piece of land, um, and an awful lot of of, uh, of uh, uh, I guess journalist um, uh, attention being paid to that, and obviously international uh, attention being paid to it. But in July, it looked like. Uh, basically, the, the war was about to end. Um, if we look at the map on the left, what you see is the sort of in the X's, uh, you see that the sort of the area around Donetsk had been basically surrounded um, and, and, and cut off from the area around Luhansk. Uh, but then something changes. And what changes is the direct invasion by Russian forces uh, from the area of Rostov uh, in the southern part, in other words, along the, uh, the Sea of Azov. Um, and movements, the direct invasion, and we have the Battle of Ilovaisk, which ends relatively badly for the, no, actually, it's very badly for the Ukrainian forces. Um, and at that point, it becomes a true international conflict. Nevertheless, I think it's important to understand that even though it is an international conflict, Ukraine, at the result of Ukraine's, basically, um, at, after the Minsk Accords of 2015, um, and the stabilization of the front line that you see on the map on the right, um, basically loses, including Crimea and including those eastern sections, Ukraine loses a grand total of seven percent of its of its of its territory. Um, the, the the statement from many is that it's half the site, half of Ukraine has been lost, or half of Ukraine has become pro-Russian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think it's important to understand that that is a misnomer. Also, it's important to understand that in that five-year period between 14 and 2019, probably the period that we've had the, the, the most amount of reforms in the country of any period in the post-independence um, environment. We, that includes anti-corruption, decentralization, civil service reform, police reform, specifically in traffic patrols, healthcare, uh, business climate, um, public procurement, and I personally was involved a little bit in education reform, uh, as uh, Marco was nice enough to mention at the beginning. Um, we're still have, we still have this elusive piece that we're looking for. And obviously, uh, when I end the chronicle section of, uh, of the book, I'm, end I'm ending it with a period just before the 2019 election period. And obviously, the most uh, the election campaign and most, most important thing on the election, uh, uh, the most important election issue, of course, uh, in that campaign was the issue of peace and how can it be achieved? Obviously elusive to this day, but nevertheless, uh, something that Ukrainians are very much interested in seeing happen. So the second half of the book tries to look, and I'll, I'll go through this quickly, hopefully, because I, I do realize that I'm, I've been asked to do this in 40 minutes and I'm already at, at 30, so I'll go through it uh, as quickly as I can, and hopefully there will be some questions in the, in the, in the second half. Um, looking at sort of Ukraine's revolution as being sort of a triple, uh, three-dimensional issue. So most importantly, and perhaps most in the news, is the national dimension, and I think one of the things that is, uh, is it, this is a, a really good quote that we see from the initial Maidan protesters, and that is that in searching for Europe, we found Ukraine. It was very much sort of an identity revolution. What we found is um, some interesting things that, uh, for example, in the last, I would say, seven years, I live in Kyiv, which um, uh, I've been living in Kyiv for the last 20 years. I have never seen Kyiv be as Ukrainian speaking as it is today. Uh, we have very much sort of people making an active choice to speak Ukrainian. And that is, uh, that, that's a very conscious personal choice and it's not something that comes easily. And it's not just a question of sort of public, et cetera. It's, it's a matter of people make the choice that this is an identity issue. Um, crucial importance of symbolism, um, the sort of the, the idea of, 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 I guess, the, the modernization of uh, traditional symbolism. For example, the Cossack siege, um, the, the anthem, the flag, uh, many things have become sort of that, that used to be perhaps seen as perhaps as somewhat archaic, become very much a modern um, sort of identity identity symbolism, and it's about inclusive patriotism, which is definitely not ethno nationalistic, 
and, and, and again has, has to do with contemporization of historical symbols that very often actually don't make an awful lot of sense. Like for example, um, uh, the, the, the attempt to make Crimean Tatars historically Ukrainian. Uh, if you know anything about Ukrainian history in the Cossack period, to make to claim that Crimean Tatars are historically Ukrainian is, well, let's just say problematic. Um, nevertheless, it's definitely about the sort of inclusive, uh, inclusive patriotism, and I would even say a perhaps territorial nationalism, if you like. Um, this is reflected in, in changing voting patterns, and I talk about this quite a bit in the book because this is the, the traditional way of looking at Ukraine, is that it is very much a divided country. So if we look at the uh, the election of 1994, Kuchma versus Kravchuk, you see a clear dividing line. You see that dividing line moving eastward in the next elections, uh, 10 years later between Yushchenko and Yanukovych, and in 2010 between Timoshenko and Yanukovych, there is again this dividing line that supposedly um, represents what Ukraine is all about. But then in 2014, you see Poroshenko basically gaining a plurality throughout the country, and there is very definitely, if we look at the 2019 election, there is no regional aspect to that election anymore, or at least that regional aspect does not reflect what traditionally is seen as the sort of the dividing line in Ukraine. One of the things that I very much am, am adamant about in the book is that the traditional dividing line between this predominantly Russian speaking East and South and predominantly Ukrainian speaking West and Center is passé. That is no longer the case because we have a very interesting new phenomenon called the Russian speaking Ukrainian patriots, which is very much about Southern Ukraine and a little bit about Poltava as well. But the point is that the concept of the Russian speaking Ukrainian patriot was something that I think that really was a miscalculation by Putin, was a miscalculation by many social scientists in the West. Um, and, and, and sort of this idea that supposedly Ukraine was a country of two solitudes is really something that we really need to leave in the past. When we look at some of the, I, I, I quoted this in the book, I realize this is quite complex. I just want to look at some, some polling data, which I think is very interesting. This is polling data that was taken in late 2013 and compared to early 2014. In other words, uh, just before the Maidan and just after the Maidan, but before, this is the, the last poll that was possible in the Donbass. I want to point out just uh, three things in this poll. The question was, who do you consider yourself to be in the first place? Citizen of Ukraine changes nationally from 50% to 64% in a span of six months. That is an identity shift that is absolutely massive if we look at it at a national level. Resident of the region or, uh, or oblast or group of oblasts that I live in, uh, that unfortunately is something that rises in the Donbass. In other words, we have this regional identity that becomes very, very important in the Donbass. And also citizen of the former Soviet Union becomes a very important aspect of the identity of the Donbass. And you see those, um, those uh, those particular parameters receiving very, very little support in the rest of Ukraine. That might explain quite a bit in terms of why the Donbass uh, ended up, and the story of the Donbass uh, ended up the way it did. Obviously, it is very much about an identity story uh, that is perhaps different from the rest of Ukraine. One of the interpretations is that the line that I was showing you previously has just moved radically eastward, and it basically corresponds to the line of separation today. Perhaps that needs to be investigated further. Um, second dimension that I look at, which I think is, is also interesting, is this idea of socioeconomic change a little bit, but I don't really look at it as a class thing. I look at it as a question of <laughs> a question that I got asked very often uh, by journalists. Uh, who finances the protesters? And this was a, a finance. This was a fabulous question because um, the, the the Kremlin was putting out various types of fakes about supposedly the CIA was financing this, or it was a somehow a Western plot, etc. And the answer that I was giving, and quite frankly, it is the the genuine answer, is that this was being financed by a new post-industrial class that was demanding representative leadership. That was demanding. Um, that was demanding, if you like, a, a, what we call bourgeois values, if you like. In other words. Um, IT people, uh, very much people that were sort of in the journalism profession, very much sort of small business, uh, medium-sized business owners, very people that very interesting, very anti-left and highly suspicious of the state. And I would say even in many cases, uh, proclaiming a sort of a libertarian, if you like, 
uh, economic program, which was in fact in dissonance with the EU. In other words, not something that sort of conforms to European social democracy. Um, and interestingly enough, it was something that uh, became part of the major, I guess, uh, election platform, economic election platform of uh, Zelensky in 2019 and of the first post-Zelensky government that was led by, by Alexei Honchuruk, um, which was all about deregulation, infrastructure, um, building infrastructure, introducing a land market, anti-conglomerate policies, at least in terms of what is being said, uh, perhaps not in, not in terms of implementation capacity at the moment yet, but certainly in terms of what is being said, we're looking at very much a sort of a right of center economic policy being generally accepted as, um, as sort of the, 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 the consensus of the day. Final thing, final aspect of the revolution, I call it the postmodern dimension. And here I'm talking about postmodern, not in the sense perhaps normally used as sort of postmodern uh, in the Western sense, but simply what comes after modernity. Um, so modernity is followed, modernity is about sort of, and is about this, this concept of the individual being sent front and center uh, to, uh, to, to the ideas that underpin Western, um, Western democracies and liberal democracies in general. And here we have this idea of dignity. The dignity idea is something I'm actually, I, I'm hoping to investigate further. Uh, uh, I, I have applied for uh, for some for some funding to uh, to do a, a bit of a sabbatical leave next year, and to look at at this concept of dignity as a relational concept that's not necessarily compatible with the individual idea, because the idea the idea of hedonist in Ukrainian is not really translated very well into dignity. It's very much a sort of a communitarian uh, concept that comes closer to the philosophy of personalism which emphasizes the significance and viability of the person, but also that relational or communitarian dimension, which I think is very interesting. Um, when I did some surveys, um, uh, limited unfortunately, but nevertheless, um, looking at some very interesting uh, things of, of, of applying some research done by Hofstede, uh, who looks at individualism, collectivism, Ukrainians generally come out with this idea of radical support for individual rights, and at the same time, collective responsibility. And this has to do with this idea of perhaps a, a, an idea of natural justice, which translates into um, and, and which basically became very, very important in this leader, leaderless, largely movement that we saw. Uh, I have published a little bit about this. So if anybody's interested in looking at that, uh, that, uh, that you can just sort of Google dignity, fairness, and heterarchy, and it'll come up with a, uh, with a short article that's specifically on that, that dimension, which I think is perhaps the most interesting because it's very much about a philosophical senses, which again, according to Hannah Arendt, is something that must uh, be born in a, in a revolution. Um, I very often get asked where we're going from here. And I think that we are at the moment in very much a sort of a, a, a point of bifurcation. And that is uh, we've gone through our period of moderate reform uh, where we've gone through some um, sort of ceasing the external threat and, and balancing the, uh, the, the war that's going on in the East, the ongoing war. Um, and we're now into sort of a populist reform attempted peace, but it's not about a Maidan rhetoric anymore. And, and if we go along the French or the Russian path, we're looking at sort of an institutional disintegration and perhaps some additional territory loss. I'm very much an optimist and believe we are very much about institution building. And that's something that I'm trying to take part in uh, uh, myself. Um, it's a long, long schlag, as we know, and it's something that comes uh, over time. So I've tried to sort of bring together two, two ideas in this book. Uh, one is to chronicle the, what we lived through um, from a point of view of a sort of a participant observer. And the, the, other, the other perspective is to try to bring my, my own background as a sociologist and a little bit of political science into uh, trying to understand uh, from an agent's perspective what in fact was going on on the ground. Um, and I see some questions that have come up in the Q&A, so I'm going to be very happy to try to answer them. You know what, Marco? I yeah. actually... I was actually able to do it in 40 minutes. I think that's I know cool. exactly 40 minutes. Very commendable. Very commendable. Yes, uh, we're opening up the floor to questions. We have a couple. I'll start with one of my own. Uh, I enjoyed your book very much. And one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is uh, you do mention in your book uh, that many of the role models for the Maidan, for this revolution of dignity, uh, were not necessarily politicians, but these heroes of previous revolutions. So 
Could you comment on these previous revolutions, more specifically uh, the revolution of the granite and the Ukraine without Kuchma uh, protests? How much were they precursors of the revolution of, of dignity versus the Orange Revolution? And uh, how did this influence what took place eventually with the revolution dignity? Do you understand the question? Yeah, I, I, th I think I do. I think, first yeah. of all, um, I, I, when I mentioned in the book, I talk about, I, and, and I, I actually, I should, um, I should point to the work of uh, Ola Onuch, uh, who's done actually quite a bit of, of work on looking at uh, sort of the, the, the precursors of revolution in Ukraine, but also uh, uh, comparing Ukraine's revolutions to various protest movements in the work in the world as well. Um, and I think it's important, particularly for students to understand, I mean, students are always in, in Ukraine are usually the catalysts of revolution and, um, or catalysts of protests, let's put it that way, um, because that was important in the revolution of granite. It was very much about student protest. Then the Ukraine without Kuchma was very much a student protest or at least a young people led protest. The orange revolution was less about students, but also had a student wing. And here in the Euromaidan, we had the beginning, the Euromaidan phase was about students and then students were kind of sidelined, if you like. So in each case, we have, we have students that are, uh, that are, that are I think, um, using role models of their older predecessors. And I think this is an interesting observer that, that, uh, observation that Ole comes to, uh, that um, you know, the students that were doing the Euromaidan in 2013 were very much looking at people from the Pora movement in 2004 and looking at, oh, wait a minute, these people sort of have their place in history now. And, um, and they sort of, uh, and, and I wouldn't mind being exactly like them. Uh, and prior to that, I would even say that the people that were involved, the student movement of the Revolution of Granite, we're looking at 1990, those have become, in fact, mythologized, I think. Um, many of the student leaders there have become mythologized in, um, in Ukrainian discourse, and they're talked about in schools and in, in, um, and in history books. People like Oles Duny, Markiani Vashtishin, um, are, are very much about, uh, you know, th these are the people that, that we, uh, the, the Ukrainian kids learn about in, in school. And so many of them want to be like that. And how do you become, how do you become well known? You become a protest leader. Um, at the same time, I think it's very important that um, the Euro, uh, the Maidan itself was not about, um, it was not about institutionalized policy and it, oh, sorry, institutionalized politics. And it was definitely not about institutionalized party leaders. And in fact, the three formal party leaders, meaning Yatsenyuk, Tjernibok and um, Klitschko, were very often looked upon as very skeptically uh, by the protesters themselves. This was very much a leaderless in uh, movement. And even though the, uh, the, the dialogue between the regime and the protesters had to go through the nominal leadership of the, uh, the party leaders, the party leaders themselves really didn't, 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 um, uh, didn't control the protests. And I think that's important because it then had that same leaderless or if you like non-hierarchical uh, social uh, dimension had another um, I mean, instantiation, if you like, uh, in the, the the battalions, in the volunteer battalions. This was not about trusting the uh, and and following the formal hierarchy of uh, of of military command. This was very much about volunteers, and obviously they were involved in the military command. But as Poroshenko told me once in a in a in a conversation, there was it wasn't a private conversation. It was actually there was about thirty of us there. But he was saying this was something that was very difficult as he, for him as commander in chief to in fact control um, because many of the volunteer battalions were about, well, yes, we received an order, but you know what? Um, let's just sort of, you know, take it with a grain of salt. In other words, uh, they, were con they, were, uh, they were very much um, coordinating their activities on the ground, but this was not necessarily coordinated back to central command in Kiev which again is a very similar thing to what we see as the anti-hierarchical kind of social structures that, it, that, that came out of the protest movement. Interesting, thank you. Um, you mentioned during your talk today, and of course in your book uh, about this open university, Maidan, and you, uh, your lesson there, I think in December of 13, 
Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what that was? Because we hear about this SOAP University and it sounds very interesting, and but I don't think people really understand, you know, what it actually was. And also, um, you know, you're an educator, you work in academia. Is, are there any links to what's happened in education afterwards? Was this a stimulus oh, yeah. for things? Uh, and how did that end up being implemented in today's education in Ukraine, if at all? Okay, well, first of all, the Open University of Maidan uh, was a great name, uh, catchy, uh, obviously, uh, but I wouldn't certainly wouldn't call it a university. Uh, what this was, was an interesting idea whereby the, um, the main stage on the Maidan, which was the, cent the central piece of the protests, um, and in fact, it had been, it was in exactly the same spot as the 2014, excuse me, 2004 Orange Revolution protests. Uh, they had a, 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 um, a stage in exactly the same spot. It was right on Khrushchev at, at that end of the, uh, of the Maidan. On the other end, uh, we set up a sort of an alternative stage. And the reason for that alternative stage was because the main stage was kind of controlled and occupied by the political party leaders. And even though during the day it was kind of an open mic, during the evenings, uh, it was very much a political, political stage. Um, and we understood that we, we I guess we, we found a sponsor, found, found somebody that was able to, uh, to, to organize this, set up a little stage that was on the other end uh, of the Maidan. And in fact, this was a, a large enough um, large enough square that the two stages were not kind of uh, interfering with each other. Um, and there we would do various uh, sort of lectures and we'd have, uh, it's very difficult to do a lecture when it's minus 13, uh, excuse me, Fahrenheit, it would be around, I guess, plus five. Um, it's, it's difficult to keep an audience uh, interested uh, in that kind of weather. Um, so the, the lectures would tend to be sort of 20 minutes to half an hour. And this was more about sort of inciting a little bit of discussion. Uh, people needed some intellectual, I guess, interaction. Um, we'd have uh, guest speakers that would be from various, some, some historians, some economists, some sociologists, political scientists, lots of uh, business school people. Um, that would sort of talk about their own their own particular um, ideas uh, and, and topics. Uh, the, originally, was uh, the idea was this is a student protest, therefore we need to support the students. And if the students aren't in class, then we need to cl take classes to them. But in fact, we need to realize that by mid-December, this was no longer about a student protest. So it was about something different. Um, now, mm, your second question is about uh, is about educational reform, and obviously, I can talk about that for a long time. Uh, I would never have considered myself to even uh, come, I mean, if someone had asked me in 2012, 2013, would you ever consider yourself for, I guess, government service? The answer would be absolutely not. Uh, I'm about as distant from government service as possible. I think many of us after the Maidan realized that, um, you know, if it's, it, if, it, if it's not us, it's going to be, it's not going to get done. In other words, if, if you don't do it yourself, you're not, it's not going to get done. So this is one of the things that we learned from 2004. Uh, that uh, Ukraine needs activists in government. And um, so many of the reforms that I mentioned in my presentation were done, in fact, by sort of Maidan activists coming into uh, the government for a short period of time. I actually call them, I use um, uh, a, a term uh, from a, a, a book called The Shadow Elite, uh, called the Flexians, people that sort of come in, flex a little bit, and they're kind of they're, they're in between government and business and academia, and they're kind of flexing, flexing their careers. Uh, in terms of educational reform, I was personally involved with adopting, uh, together with Minister Kvit, uh, adopting the new law on higher education, which provided significant amounts of university autonomy, uh, brought in uh, formalized PhD programs, similar to what, what, what exists in Europe, um, was very much about cleaning up corruption in the, uh, in the higher education sector, I then became an advisor to Minister Hrenevich, who was involved with bringing something called the New Ukrainian School into, uh, into reality. And this was about reforming um, uh, primary and secondary education, excuse me, primary and, and high school, if you like, primary education uh, into something that will be more competence-based. Uh, and now I'm involved in something called the National Agency for Higher Education Quality Assurance, uh, which is a, um, a, a, an institution that does accreditation. Um, I think it's, it's it kind of a, a how you bridge academia with activism. It's always an interesting question for us Maidan people. Uh, but many of us did the same thing. I think that uh, many of the names that we hear um, are people that were 
that were educated in the West in one way or another. And after the Maidan, uh, saw an opportunity to, to do some good in the country and uh, basically served for two or three years and then went back to their careers. Some of them are still in public service. Others have, have decided to move on. Uh, but I think that that's a, that's a very important aspect of, again, this, this grassroots uh, revolutionary uh, movement that really typified what was going on in, in, in the post-2014 period. Thank you. Um, question uh, from Pavlo Ilyashenko. I wonder how the regional and social economic composition of the Maidan protests have changed from December to February. The data you showed us is from early December. I would guess that with time, quite many people came from regions to the capital. Similarly, the composition could change from the majority cave-based middle class to the majority of blue collar workers from the regions. Yeah, and I, I talk about this in the book actually, because I think it's, um, there is obviously a change of composition of protesters, uh, not, and, and what was I think very important to understand about the protest movement is that um, it, the, the numbers of people would surge in the evenings. So, uh, people in Kiev would still go to work in December. They would go to work in January. Uh, there was a certain element of uh, protesters that were, as you put it, blue collar uh, and very often regional, very often from the unemployed, uh, very often unemployed, uh, bring, being brought in or, or coming in to camp out at the, uh, at the Maidan. Uh, but life in Kiev continued uh, to go on, and I think that's important to understand. And so um, people would come to the Maidan after work, and people would come to the Maidan on Saturdays. Sundays was Vicha Day, which means that Kiev would be filled with people, and you would have protest crowds of 10, 20,000, hundreds of thousands very often. Uh, and obviously, New Year's was a big party. Um, so I think that, I mean, it, the point is that, that Kiev very de definitely continued to support the protests because the protests could not have happened without local Kiev support. But the people that were manning the protests on a permanent basis, if you like, or spending the nights in the tents were very often not from Kiev. Uh, and not only they were, they were not only spending the nights in the tents, they were very often, I mean, there was, there was the uh, uh, Kiev Expo Plaza, which is um, um, uh, a, uh, I guess a trade show hall. Um, uh, people would spend the nights in the local Catholic cathedral, um, local in other words, apartments, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, there's quite a few people coming in from the regions, uh, and they would be the ones that would be manning the protests during the day and into the night. Uh, and then uh, in the evenings, Kiev would, would come to support. Thank you. Uh, Maria Katzman asks, it seems that parts of Sobozhanshchina are being assumed as Art to Donbass and are not being evaluated when discussing dignity and Ukrainian patriotism. As a young person having no relationship to the Soviet Union from that region, I would not agree that just Poltava is a Ukrainian identifying Russian speaking region. What about Kharkiv? Would you be interested would be interested in hearing your opinion on that? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I apologize if I if I uh, if I was not uh, detailed enough in my in my regional aspect of what I was saying. Uh, certainly uh, the Kharkiv is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects, I mean, of that I, that I actually do describe in the book. Um, we now know that the, uh, the whole idea of Novorossiya uh, was supposed to have started from Kharkiv. And uh, this was, in fact, one of the major failures of the Kremlin plan, because the idea was that Kharkiv, as the closest, to the, the closest large city to uh, the Russian border, uh, was supposed to have become the center of something called Kharkivska Narodna Respublika, in other words, Kharkiv's People's Republic. And that didn't happen, quite the opposite. That attempt was quashed very, very quickly. And uh, the uh, regional uh, identity of Kharkiv as a non-Russian, and I would actually even say not particularly Ukrainian, but more Ukrainian than Russian uh, city, uh, became very, very important to that particular plan failing. As for Poltava, I, I fully agree with you. And as for Slobozhanshchina, in other words, the northern part of Luhansk region, um, which is generally actually perhaps more Ukrainian speaking, or at least more Surzhik speaking than it would be Russian speaking, I certainly agree with you there. Um, and it, there, there's actually no 
uh, it's not a particular surprise that the border between what we call the LNR, in other words, the, the Luhansk People's Republic, as I put that in quotes, uh, and um, uh, the Ukrainian-controlled part of Luhansk region runs uh, through uh, Seversky Donets. In other words, that, that region, that, that river, in fact, north of it generally is farmland, and Ukrainian speaking, south of it tends to be coal miners, and, and, uh, and, and that's, and that's it largely explains some of the cultural differences within that one, uh, one oblast as well. Okay, well, we'll try to get a couple more questions in uh, before we wrap up. Uh, Yanis Tiligakis, why do you call the war uh, as Russia's war and not a civil war? You could also call it a USA-Russia war conducted on Ukrainian soil, like US and Jar Germany fought on Polish and also Ukrainian territory in World War II. Okay, well, Yanis, thank you for that question. Um, I think that you're actually asking exactly the question that my book is trying to argue against. Uh, first of all, I don't see... Um, the, uh, I don't see the conflict in Ukraine definitely as a civil war. It's certainly not a civil war. Secondly, I think we put much too much stock into interpreting the events in Ukraine from a geopolitical perspective, uh, something that supposedly is US versus Russia or NATO versus Russia, et cetera. Um, it is obvious to, to, to the people on the ground that there are Russian troops on the ground. Uh, it is also obvious to people on the ground that the Ukrainian side is, um, well, let's just say Ukrainian, um, not, uh, not American or CIA or something like that. Um, so, or, and certainly not NATO troops are far, far, far from the, from the, um, uh, from the conflict area. Uh, and in terms of the, the, the 200 or so, uh, 200 or so uh, advisors that we currently have in the country. So I think we make much too much of the geopolitical aspect. Um, this was very much about an invasion uh, and the Crimean, the Crimean debacle and the annexation of Crimea is certainly about invasion. Uh, the Eastern Ukrainian, uh, in other words, the, the Donbass conflict is certainly about invasion as well, uh, as I tried to show in, the, uh, in, in my section on the maps. Uh, had it not been for the Ru direct Russian invasion, in other words, direct invasion of Russian troops on the ground, including the ones that shot down MH17, uh, we would never have had uh, a, a, a war in Eastern Ukraine, simple as that. Thank you. Um, Alex Gotes uh, asks, in your book, you focus a lot on the topic of dignity and you seem to draw on the ideas of Hannah Ardent and the history of modern Israel. As Ukrainians are reflecting on the philosophical notion of dignity, are they primarily drawing on the European experience of the Holocaust or are they drawing on other experiences as well? I think that's a fantastic question. I thank you very much for it, because I think that it's not just, I mean, obviously the experience of the Holocaust is extremely important. And there are many, many Ukrainians that would draw direct parallels between the history of the Holocaust and the history of the Holodomor um, as being uh, obviously uh, issues of, of, of um, or both cases of, of mass death and mass murder. Uh, and obviously cases where we, we talk about uh, the, the value of human life. Uh, that is one aspect of dignity, which I think is extremely important. And certainly the, those experiences are very important in understanding the concept of dignity from an individual perspective, because those are the, the sanctity of human life, uh, which is, a, which is a, uh, reflected in the concept of dignity, certainly in the Kantian world, if you like. But um, I think that there's something uh, unique to the Ukrainian concept of hedonist as well. And this is the concept of, uh, which I try to get around in this idea of personalism, where it's not just about individuality uh, and the sanctity of the individual, but it's also about, if you like, a collective or perhaps a communitarian dignity. Uh, and that that dignity has a right to be recognized. Um, and I think that that's something that in, a, uh, in, in, in English language discourse, at least, I have not seen that uh, uh, significantly uh, developed. Uh, certainly it is developed in sort of the more philosophical aspects of, for example, Carol, Carol Wojtyla uh, and, and, and or otherwise known as Pope John Paul II, uh, Thomas Aquinas, and those types of people that would talk about sort of the communitarian aspect of the individual, um, which, which I think was a very important aspect of, of understanding what was going on uh, in this demand for hedonist in Ukraine. It wasn't just about individualism. It was, in fact, about a combination of an individual within a community. 
uh, which I think is a which is a, I think is a, a novel concept that still needs to be um, uh, I think uh, investigated further. Thank you. And this will be the final question and we're gonna wrap up. Uh, Camilio Dominguez uh, writes, thank you for your interesting talk. Could you tell us a little bit more about the alleged far-right political role in Ukraine's Maidan? In Russian rhetoric, since, uh, in Russian rhetoric, since then we can find numerous allusions to Maidan as a coup d'etat led by far-right movements with Western support. Which persons, activists or groups does the Russian government identify as being part of far-right groups? Uh, look, I don't think it, it'd be fair to uh, state that there were no far-right activists on the Maidan at all. But I think that there is much, 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 uh, I mean, it, it's, it's massively overstated in terms of this idea of it supposedly being a right-wing coup d'etat. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 I guess, um, the favorite of uh, the Russian narrative is to attack uh, what we call the right sector, the Pravi sector, um, and Mitroyaro specifically, and then looking at volunteer battalions, looking at the Azov, uh, and, and certain others, perhaps a little bit Aidar, uh, and, and, and those types of, of places. I mean, obviously there was a right-wing um, uh, element of it. However, to uh, minimize, or if you like, to, 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 um, uh, to reduce the uh, to reduce the Maidan and the revolution to a right-wing coup d'etat is just false. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it's not just, it, it, it's not even simplistic, it's just false. Um, we don't, uh, the, um, the Pravi sector was extremely important as a, uh, in, in, certain, in certain events that had to do with, I guess, stoking some of the initial violence. Um, but the people that were on the Maidan were not about right-wing activism. And that became exceptionally clear in the 2014 elections, um, both for president and for parliament, when the combined uh, right-wing movements got less than, I think, 4%, if I'm not mistaken. In other words, Tjernibok, um, Svoboda, plus the right, uh, the Pravi sector uh, got less than 4, 4 or 5%, which is three times less than right-wing parties in Europe would get. In other words, I'm talking about AFD in Germany or Front National in France. Um, so, I mean, to, to reduce things to a right-wing protest is just, it's, it's to say, it would be the equivalent of saying that I was responsible for the Maidan. And that's just plain wrong. Uh, the best we can do is chronicle what, we, what would happen and to under, try, try to understand this as a truly grassroots mass movement that had representation in all regions, in all language speakers, in all denominations, Muslim, uh, various Christian denominations, Jewish, uh, there was a, there was, a, I mean, atheist, uh, all sorts of people on the Maidan, uh, all sorts of people in the in the volunteer battalions. Um, one of the most interesting people that I've met in some of my interviews uh, is a fellow uh, who was a, a, a former, well, he is in fact a rabbi, uh, and he joined the Pravi sector. Uh, and he called, he was, he's the author of the t-shirt that says Jido Bandera, and he wears that uh, very proudly together with a yarmulke. Um, in other words, I, I think that, that, that the, this concept of the supposedly a right-wing um, conspiracy uh, is just a complete misnomer. Unfortunately, as with many other things that come out of Ukraine uh, or that, that concern Ukraine, it has been twisted and has certainly been uh, used not to Ukraine's advantage by its current external enemy. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mikhailo. Uh, we are out of time. I want to thank all our listeners uh, for your attention and for your questions. And again, thank you, Mikhailo, for writing this book. Uh, the links are there. Please pick up a copy of the book. Uh, thanks for your talk and, and good luck with your continued research. All Thank you very time. much. Thank you for having me. And I enjoyed it very much. Thanks. All right. All the best. Bye-bye.